Welcome everyone to the third event of the USF SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice 2014-15 academic year. Tonight we will hear from scholar, author, poet, writer, rock star, Dr. Joy Layden. Founded in 2008, the USF Jewish Studies and Social Justice program is the first and regrettably only program in the history of the United States on the planet Earth, formally linking Jewish studies with social justice. In addition to offering numerous courses related to this interdisciplinary field, our program offers a minor in Jewish studies and social justice, as well as an annual speaker series related to Jewish identities, an annual social justice lecture delivered each spring, and an annual social justice Passover Seder. In addition, in partnership with a number of different Bay Area-based organizations, like the Jewish Community Center of San Francisco, as well as countless synagogues, mosques, and other institutions, we offer unique educational programs related to ways to end and transform ethnic and national conflicts, such as our summer program, Beyond Bridges, Israel and Palestine. If you're interested in being put on our Jewish Studies and Social Justice listserv, please add your name to the sign-up sheet found on the table back there. Now let us begin tonight's program officially. Going back thousands of years, perhaps to the earliest notions of recorded history, human beings have been grappling with ideas such as right and wrong, justice and injustice, and responsibility. From Adam and Eve to the late Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, these issues continue to play a central role in many of our lives today, whether in San Francisco or Cairo, New York City or Jerusalem. For Heschel, arguably the greatest modern day prophet of the Jewish community of the last century, Social justice is about balancing the tension between one's individual identity and one's communal or human identity. Tonight's speaker epitomizes this tension, someone who lives and identifies as a Jew as well as a basic human being, someone who has insight into the ever-changing notion of social identities far beyond perhaps most of our own understandings. It's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight our guest speaker, Dr. Joy Layden, the David and Ruth Gottesman Professor of English at the Stern College of Yeshiva University. Ms. Layden is the author of at least five books of poetry, Coming to Life, Psalms, The Book of Anna, and Alternative, Alternatives to History, as well as a critically acclaimed autobiography, Through the Door of Life, A Jewish Journey Between Genders. After hearing from Ms. Layden, perhaps we might have a few minutes to open the floor to questions. Please join me in welcoming Joy Layden. Thank you, Aaron. I, am I audible? So let me turn you off. Turn me on. Yes. <laughs> Go for it. You're on. Going to add a whole new dimension to Judaism and social justice. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to do something which, um, which I hate it when people do it to me, which is I'm going to read you a paper, which um, as I look at it, none of these sentences sound like anybody actually talks. So I'm going to do that. The reason I um, put it together this way is because I've been given maybe 60, 70 talks about gender identity stuff in the past um, two or three years. And um, I've learned a lot. I've heard a lot of things. And I wanted to uh, try to put those things together into um, some kind of coherent understanding of um, gender as I've gotten it. And I didn't trust myself to do that extemporaneously. So I, I kind of wrote this out. Um, it will take a while, and it will sound wonky in places. Um, but afterward, I'm really hoping we'll get to talk at, like in actual human voices. So um, this is indeed called The Genesis of Gender. I um, wasn't sure that I would live up to the title when I told Aaron, that I was going to write to talk about that, but yes, here it is. In the beginning, there was gender. We were all born into a world in which to be human is to be gendered, to be divided by gender, assigned roles based on gender, taught to understand ourselves and our relationships with others in terms of gender. We inherited this world from our parents, who inherited it from their parents, and on and on back to the dawn of humanness when hominids began extrapolating the physical difference between male and female bodies into systems of meaning that go far beyond chromosomes, 
genitals, secondary sex characteristics, or reproductive functions. Both those who embrace gender as an innate human characteristic and those who reject it as an oppressive ideology often point to the story of creation that opens the book of Genesis to explain our deeply ingrained habit of defining human beings in terms of gender. When we examine that story, we find that it offers us a glimpse of a time when maleness and femaleness weren't yet freighted with social, ideological, and psychological meanings that we've come to associate with them. In fact, when we look at the first chapter of Genesis, we don't find gender at all. God creates light and dark, day and night, sky and earth, seas, plants, stars, sun and moon, animals, sea creatures and birds, cattle, creeping things, and wild beasts of every kind, and even human beings, without referring to gender. And God said, let us make humanity in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humanity in God's own image. Male and female, God created them. Though God creates humanity male and female, establishing a binary that divides all human beings into one category or another, these categories refer to physical sex rather than gender. How can we tell? The gender binary does more than differentiate between male and female bodies. It assigns different roles to male and female. But when we look at the verses that follow God's creation of humanity, we find that God addresses just created humans collectively and equally, blessing and instructing them without distinguishing male and female roles. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and, and so forth and so on. Right? If you, there's nothing in there that says, guys, you have dominion over the fish and Women, you have dominion over the creeping things, or you know, I mean, that would be gender. That would be giving significance to the division between male and female. God does not seem to be doing that. Neither the two defining characteristics of humanity, being created in God's image and dominion over other creatures, nor the human place in the food chain are ascribed differently to males and females. Though God's divided humanity physically, those ca categories of male and female have none of the social and psychological significance we call gender. But of course, the division of humanity into male and female is the foundation of the gender binary, which ascribes different roles, characteristics, feelings, desires, earning capacity, and authority to men and to women. And though God doesn't create the gender binary, in the first chapter of Genesis, God does establish binaries, yin-yang style, mutually exclusive and mutually defining categories as a fundamental feature of the universe, a way of thinking and talking that enables God and us to bring clarity out of confusion, simplicity out of complexity, order out of chaos. Creation famously begins when God says, let there be light. But though light is created in itself without regard to the darkness we are told preceded creation, God immediately transforms light from a unique phenomenon into one part of a binary category. And God divided the light from the darkness. Prior to this division, apparently, light and darkness weren't mutually exclusive categories. They existed independently of one another and thus could intertwine, interpenetrate. God simplifies their relationship by dividing them into mutually exclusive binary categories. The light-darkness binary like the male-female binary, refers only to physical differences. But God, exemplifying another habit of binary thinking, charges those differences with human significance by associating them with another binary. And God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. Light and dark are categories for physical phenomena that have no inherent human meaning. Day and night are human categories for dividing time. The association of day with light and night with darkness is true to most human experience, but it's a generalization rather than a built-in feature of reality. For example, those who live near the poles experience days of darkness and nights when it is always light, but they still call those days days and those nights nights. Associating the binary of light-darkness with the binary of day-night, after associating them, God moves on to other aspects of creation 
but human cultures pile on further associations. For example, because light enables us to see, and we associate seeing with the ability to understand, light becomes associated with understanding and darkness with ignorance. Since light and darkness are binary categories, whatever we associate with one is dissociated from the other. If light is associated with goodness, darkness is associated with evil. If light is associated with truth, darkness is, is associated with falsehood. When we compare them to the physical phenomena on which they're based, such binary webs of association are nonsense. But the cognitive habits they foster are hard to shake or even recognize, as we see in racial stereotyping, in which those whose skins are classified as light are unconsciously seen as better than those whose skins we classify as dark. But even the physical categories of light and darkness are human constructions, simplifications of what physicists recognize as infinite degrees of variation in electromagnetic radiation. Similarly, when we examine actual human skin tones, we find many shades and variations that are vastly oversimplified by binary categories such as black-white. Such, such categories refer to social ideas, not physical phenomena. Despite the inadequacy of binary categories to reflect the complexity of existence, we habitually rely on them as a shorthand for organizing and interpreting the world. In fact, we think of the world in binary terms precisely because binaries simplify the overwhelming complexity of existence, enabling us to lump subtle degrees of variation into broad, clear-cut, mutually exclusive categories whose differences are readily apparent. There are innumerable degrees of darkness and light. If we needed words for each of them and could ref only refer to them when we had determined the exact degree of darkness or light, we'd find it difficult to refer to them at all. This is why Eskimos do not have 35 or 72 or 168 words for snow, right? Imagine the amount of testing you'd have to do before you could just say, snowing outside. Um, if Genesis were written in the language of physics, rather than, and God called the light day and the darkness God called night, it would have had to say something like, and God called the period of time when the yet uncreated human residents of the yet uncreated planet not yet called Earth would generally perceive the greatest amount of visible electromagnetic radiation, day, and the period of time when they would generally perceive the least amount of visible electromagnetic radiation, night. I'm not sure what the theological consequences would have been, but if Genesis had avoided binary simplifications in favor of precise physical descriptions, the Bible would never have become a bestseller. In other words, binaries are sexy. They not only create powerful conceptual categories, they give us clear, concise terms for overwhelmingly complex phenomena. The gender binary is to differences in physical sex what the light-dark binary and the webs of association we layer upon it are to visible electromagnetic radiation. Though most human bodies fit scientific definitions of physical maleness or femaleness, a small but significant percentage don't. Those bodies can't accurately be described as male or female. The general and non-binary term for them is intersex, a category that embraces many different kinds of bodies. Most people aren't aware that not all human bodies are male and female. Indeed, for a long time, doctors automatically corrected the genitals of intersex babies to fit them into one category or another. This form of mutilation still occurs, despite efforts by intersex activists to stop it, proof of our profound and sometimes violent commitment to making reality fit our categories. When we turn from the sex of human bodies to the web of associations we call gender, as Judith Butler and other scholars have shown, the chasm between the complexity of human beings and the simplicity of the categories male and female yawns even wider. However cultures define the terms of the gender binary, and definitions vary greatly from one culture and time to another, few if any human beings perfectly fit the definitions of either gender. How could we? To be human is to be an ever-changing bundle of often contradictory emotions and desires, and to be shaped by unpredictable, ever-changing circumstances and relationships. No binary category can account for who and what we are. Take me, for example. My favorite example of not being counted for by the gender binary. 
Even though from early childhood, I felt that I was or should be, as a young child it was hard to say, female, for 45 years I did everything I could to maintain a male identity. It wasn't easy. I monitored myself constantly to ensure that I wouldn't talk, walk, sit, engage in activities, or even express preferences that might seem feminine. I dissociated from my body and from whatever my body felt or did. So few of my actions or experiences felt like mine that even now, I remember most of my life as a male in the third person. This life of numbness, fear, and hiding drove me to, and sometimes over, the edge of suicidal despair, but I clung to my male persona because I was terrified of something worse if the truth that I didn't fit my assigned gender role was ever discovered. I was afraid that I would not only be rejected by everyone who knew me, but that I would become something incomprehensible and monstrous to them, something that couldn't be understood or spoken with or listened to or loved, something they could no longer see as human. Whatever suffering my gender role entailed, it was worth it to be seen as human. And however oppressive or alienating my place in the gender binary felt, it was worth it to be a member of my family, to be a husband, a father, a friend, a colleague, to feel I was known and loved by others, even though I felt that because they knew me as a male, they didn't know me at all. Gender utterly misrepresented me, but it was better than being alone. That's the way the second chapter of Genesis portrays the creation of gender, as a response to human isolation. The first chapter offers a different version of creation. God simultaneously creates humanity male and female. But in the second chapter, humanity begins with a single body. And the Lord formed man, the man of dust from the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. As in the first chapter, humanity is created with sex. The man is physically male, but not with gender. Gender is a system for defining human difference, and at this point, there is no difference. The man is the only human there is. God gives the man a home, a specific place to live, the Garden of Eden, and a purpose for living, to work the garden and guard it. God even gives him a law to keep, the famous prohibition against eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But though the man has a body, a soul, life, a home, work, plants to eat, a relationship with God, and the beginning of morality, the creation of humanity isn't finished. A single being, an absolute individual, free of social roles and categories, is not yet human, because though some of us enjoy living in solitude, as a species, humans are social animals. We need others to fully become ourselves. As God realizes in verse 18, it is not good that the man be alone. And the man is very, very alone. In the first chapter's creation story, humanity is created after all the other creatures on Earth. But in chapter two, the man is made first. He's the only living thing on Earth other than vegetation. In an effort to relieve his isolation, God creates every beast of the field and every bird of the sky. The man names each creature, but none of them make him less alone. Finally, God gets it. In order not to be alone, the man, named Adam, a reference to the earth from which he was created, needs another human being. The moment Adam recognizes the new human, he creates the first version of gender, a system of binary terms defining both his difference from and his relationship to the person he calls woman. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead. And the rib, which the Lord had taken from man, God made into a woman and brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. As in chapter one, God creates the physical difference between male and female but it's Adam who gives that difference meaning. Indeed, Adam doesn't comment on the difference between his body and the woman's. Instead, he recognizes the woman as bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That recognition provides the foundation for the gender differentiation that follows, 
defining male and female as different forms of a single flesh, a single species, as human. Then Adam creates the first embryonic version of the gender binary. He names the female woman. The word for man in Hebrew is ish. Adam calls the woman isha because, he explains, she was taken out of man. Adam's act of naming transforms the physical binary male-female into a social binary, man-woman, terms that are defined not in terms of physical difference, but in relation to one another. Until this moment, ish, man, was a unique term for a unique being. Now man is one half of a binary. Maleness, till then identical with humanness, suddenly re represents only half of humanity. Adam, the absolute individual, has become part of a social system, defined both through kinship with and difference from the woman. Though the terms man and woman have little content yet, the relationship between them inspires Adam with a vision of a future filled with gender-based roles and relationships, fathers and mothers, wives and husbands, and generations of family drama, romantic attachments, and conflicting loyalties. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. For Adam, the gender binary is the basis of human society and human history. This guy has been completely alone until now and already is imagining fathers, mothers, girlfriends, conflicts about this, whose house do we go to for Thanksgiving, <laughs> sex. I mean, you know, he's, he's working fast here. For those who identify as men or women, the gender binary offers many of the benefits that made Adam so grateful to trade in his absolute individuality for a place in its role and identity defining system. The gender binary assures those who identify as men and women that we're not alone. No matter how unusual our bodies, feelings, or experiences, the gender binary defines us as like, fundamentally similar to half the human race. And as Adam found, places us in relationship to those whose bodies and roles put them on the other side of the binary. There are few differences between human beings more striking than the differences between mature male and female bodies. The gender binary helps us understand those differences, transforming otherness into complementarity that reinforces our gendered sense of who we are. But from the moment the gender binary is created, there are signs of trouble in paradise. As feminist critics have pointed out, the second chapter of Genesis presents the gender binary as something created by and for the man and imposed upon the woman. Though humanity is created equally male and female in chapter one, the second chapter is all about the man. God forms him first, designs the garden for him, creates the animals for his benefits, and only then, apt to relieve his continuing isolation, creates the woman. Though he and the woman presumably saw one another simultaneously, the story tells us only how Adam sees and understands her. In short, the genesis of gender is presented as a story about a man, his needs, and a woman who is literally created to fulfill them. Many Hollywood movies followed. We find a similar male bias in Adam's prophecy of future gendered relationships, which he describes in terms of a man leaving his family for his wife. But despite its male bias, Adam's gender binary is fairly benign. He doesn't define male and female roles or characteristics or associate them with hierarchical power arrangements. If the narrative had told us the woman's response to seeing Adam, she might well have described gender in similarly self-centered and thus gynocentric terms. This is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Therefore shall a woman leave her father and mother and shall cleave to her husband and they shall be one flesh. But in chapter three, the gender binary becomes an engine of inequality and oppression. When God responds to the violation of the prohibition against eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil by cursing the woman and the man in very different ways. Unto the woman God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow you shall bring forth children and your desire shall be to your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he, God said, because you hearkened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat of it, curse it as the ground for your sake. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread. These curses exacerbate the differences between woman and man, identifying them with different roles and transforming the gender binary into patriarchy, 
a system in which social roles, privilege, and power is divided on the basis of gender. The woman is to be ruled over by the man and burdened by childbirth, while the man is to toil and till the ground in order to get bread. But even here, at the mythic dawn of patriarchy, there are hints that there could and should be a better form of gender. Though the biblical narrative is consistently male-centered, God presents patriarchy as a curse on both men and women. And though patriarchy is the final step in the biblical genesis of gender, it comes late and seems almost accidental. When God creates Adam and the woman in chapter 2, God says nothing about gender roles, male dominance, or female submission. Even Adam's male-centered vision of the future um, ends on an egalitarian note, with husband and wife becoming one flesh. In chapter 3, patriarchy is presented not as an inherent aspect of gender, but as a tragic consequence of bad human decisions. Had those decisions gone differently, the story implies, gender would never have become patriarchal. But those are hints of a paradise that was most certainly lost. Though the gender binary has taken innumerable forms over the millennia, most of those forms all too aptly fulfill the biblical curse. Feminists, queer theorists, and others have extensively documented the psychological and social damage caused by patriarchal forms of the gender binary. But even those who are most critical tend to still identify themselves and others as males or females, men or women. Indeed, many of the most passionate feminist critiques of patriarchy insist on the essential difference between men and women, and summon women to band together on the basis of shared gender. This allegiance to the gender binary isn't surprising. It's hard for human beings to think about ourselves, our relationships, and our societies without thinking in terms of gender. Traditional cultures often divide men and women, institutionalizing and sometimes brutally enforcing gender segregation. But even in modern societies in which men and women are free to mingle, most people are homosocial. That is, most of us form friendships with people we see as being of our gender. The gender binary encourages homosociality by ensuring that people who identify with a given gender will have a lot in common, sharing socialization, roles, modes of gender expression, and the accessorizing and shopping that go along with them, and ensuring that those who identify with the other gender will shop at different stores for different clothes reflecting different roles and so on. By magnifying the sense of similarity among those of the same gender, the gender binary simultaneously magnifies the sense of difference between genders, encouraging us to see those differences as innate as the biological differences between males and females. But we're bound to the gender binary in far more intimate ways, because gender isn't just a means of relating ourselves to others. It's also a means of understanding ourselves, of organizing and discriminating among our contradictory impulses, desires, and emotions. The gender binary encourages us to embrace and express aspects of ourselves that fit the gender with which we identify, and to repress, conceal, or minimize aspects of ourselves that don't. Even when we recognize ways in which we don't fit gender binary norms, we often understand those aspects of ourselves in relation to those norms. So everybody talks about John Boehner crying, right? Because guys are not supposed to cry, and Republican guys are not even supposed to have tear ducts. So, you know, even when we see something that doesn't fit, we think of how it doesn't fit. We're still interpreting it in terms of gender norms. Of course, few of us believe that we're nothing more than what our local version of the gender binary defines as a man or a woman. We know being human is more than being male or female. Even Genesis reminds us that for a few verses, Adam was human without being part of a gender binary. And for another few verses, both the woman and the man experienced a gender binary that had not yet become an oppressively role in identifying identity-defining patriarchal system. But how can we, born into a world in which there are few aspects of our lives that aren't shaped by gender, imagine who we would be if we didn't define ourselves and one another in terms of the gender binary? One of the advantages of being transgender, of having an identity that doesn't fit binary gender categories, is that we can't rely on the gender binary to understand ourselves or our relations with others. And so we're forced to think about who we are outside its terms. 
We're reminded every day that the gender binary cannot fully account for or express humanity, our humanity. For example, though like many non-trans women, I have a female gender identity and feminine gender expression and live as a woman, I was raised and lived as a male. Even when others accept me, I know that words like female or woman or she don't mean quite the same thing when applied to me as they do when applied to those who were born, raised, and have always lived and identified as female. But at least I have a binary gender identity and can express my identity through binary defined terms that feel self-affirming and foster my relationships with others. Those who don't identify as either male or female have to constantly choose between misrepresenting themselves in order to fit in or expressing their identities in ways that mark them as outsiders to the gendered world. Some people with non-binary identities enjoy being what Kate Bornstein calls gender outlaws. Some find friends and family, partners and communities who love them as they are. But for too many, expressing their true identities leads to isolation, exile from family and community, loss of home and employment, and verbal and physical abuse by those who can't recognize people who are neither simply male nor simply female as human. But though people suffer and die every day because they can't fit within the gender binary, there's growing recognition of the presence of transgender people, and thus of the fact that there are a significant number of human beings who can't be accounted for in terms of binary gender categories. Trans people are increasingly visible, vocal, and organized, running for public office, lobbying for anti-discrimination legislation and better health care, being interviewed on news programs, publishing books and essays, appearing on TV shows and in movies, gaining academic recognition through journals such as the new Transgender Studies Quarterly, and institutions such as the University of Arizona, which just hired several tenure-track Transgender Studies professors. Every trans academic in the world apply for those jobs. Many religious denominations now have openly trans clergy, and some have developed prayers and rituals specifically for transgender people. More events and facilities include restrooms and other accommodations that aren't designated for one gender or the other. As individuals, institutions, and the cultural zeitgeist recognize the existence of trans people, recognize, as Adam did when he first saw Eve, that despite our differences, transgender people are human, we find ourselves in the midst of a new genesis of gender. Just as Adam's invention of gender transformed him as well, this new genesis of gender is slowly changing how all of us, trans and non-trans alike, understand ourselves and one another. For starters, everyone who recognizes transgender people as human also begins to recognize the gender binary's inadequacy for accounting for the nature of humanity. Not only do we recognize that there are people whose identities can't be understood in terms of binary categories, we also begin to recognize that those categories drastically oversimplify human identity. For example, as you guys saw in class today, to understand the identity of people like me, generally called transsexuals, you have to recognize that the gender binary man-woman is actually a composite of three different male-female binaries, one relating to physical sex, one relating to gender identity, the gender identity we feel, the gender we feel ourselves to be, and one relating to gender expression the shared conventions of masculinity and femininity through which we express our gender identities. Once we recognize that the gender binary conflates at least three separate binaries, we begin to recognize the complexity of gender in non-trans people as well. Some non-transgender people express their gender in ways that don't fit binary definitions of masculinity and femininity. Some have gender identities that don't quite fit binary norms. In short, as we reckon with transsexual identity, we find ourselves thinking about gender in ways that subtly expand and refine our understanding of all identity, including our own. When we recognize that some people are intersex, we realize the physical binary on which the gender binary is based is similarly inadequate. Human bodies are indeed created male and female, as the first chapter of Genesis tells us, but we're also created in ways that don't fit those categories. And when we see that, it's hard not to recognize that many non-intersex bodies also don't fit norms of maleness and femaleness. That there are women with facial hair 
and men without it. Women without breast tissue and men with plenty. <coughs> women who are over six feet tall and men who are under five feet tall. Women who don't have uteruses and men who don't have testicles. Women with low voices, my faves, and men with high voices, and so on. The simplifying blinders of binary categorization fall from our eyes, and we find ourselves confronting the dazzling variety of humanity. When we recognize that some people are gender fluid, that for them maleness and femaleness are not fixed characteristics, but different means of expressing selves they understand as both and neither male nor female, we realize that the gender binary assumption that everyone is only and always one or the other drastically oversimplifies the shifting, contradictory complexity of individual psyches. For example, there's a person in my small New England town who sometimes presents as a woman and sometimes presents as a man, but goes by the same name and expects, or at least hopes, to be recognized as the same person regardless. Few of us are gender fluid, but all of us have feelings, desires, impulses, and fantasies that don't fit the definitions of our assigned gender. Men who are physically male, identify as male, and have male gender expression feel and want things that, gender, that the gender binary defines as female or feminine. Physically female, female-identified feminine women feel and want things that are defined as male or masculine. As we recognize the humanity of those who are gender fluid, we see that no one's humanity completely fits on one side of the gender binary or the other. Those are only a few of the forms of transgender identity that are precipitating the new genesis of gender. But as we recognize and reckon with each, we see different ways in which human identity is more complex than the gender binary allows. This may seem startling, as though what it means to be human has suddenly grown infinitely more complicated. But as I said at the beginning, binaries are ways we respond to and simplify overwhelming complexity. If human beings hadn't always been much more than simply male and female, we would never have invented binary gender categories to begin with to help us understand ourselves or our relationships with one another. If there weren't any complexity to oversimplify, we wouldn't need binaries to oversimplify it. That's why it can be so challenging to confront the inadequacy of gender binary definitions of what it means to be human. The recognition of transgender identities challenges us to see that physical sex may tell us little about our psyches. We've grown up in a gendered world in which we can instantly identify others as men and women, and when we do, feel confident we know intimate details about what they're like. The recognition of transgender identities reminds us that those binary-based identifications and assumptions can often be mistaken. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? It's certainly good to acknowledge the truth. And the truth is that binary gender is a limited and inaccurate way of understanding ourselves. But like Adam, who gladly surrendered his absolute individuality for a place in the gender binary, human beings have embraced both the binary gender's limitations and inaccuracies in every time, place, and culture because we're social animals. And simplifying our individuality makes it much easier for us to understand who we are in relationship to others. That's the primary function of gender as we've known it. And it's too soon to tell how we'll understand ourselves in relation to others in the wake of the new genesis of gender. But thanks to centuries of Western feminism, we've already lived through a revolution of our, in our understanding of binary gender. The history of Western feminism is the history of the struggle to redefine what it means to be a woman. Before feminism, being a woman meant not only having a female body and gender identity, but a gender expression that fit cultural norms of femininity. Feminism insists that having a female body and gender identity doesn't require anyone to dress, talk, do work, or otherwise act in ways the gender binary defines as appropriately feminine. These days, there are few forms of female gender expression that disqualify women from being seen as real women in the United States. But in the past, if a woman wore pants, people were like, you're not really a woman. Suddenly, that was all it took. You got kicked out of the gender binary. Um, men, of course, are still in that position. It's pretty easy to be told you're not a real man if you don't toe the line. Um, but in innumerable articles, essays, TV shows, and movies attest, the liberation of women from feminine gender expression has led to social uncertainty, 
We can no longer tell if someone's a woman just based on hair length or clothing choices. Individual stress. Are women obligated to raise families? Work at paying jobs? Both? Neither? Can women have it all? Upheaval in social assumptions and institutions and strain in personal relationships. Some are exhilarated by these changes, some dismayed, but all of us have been affected by them. In a very real sense, feminism marked the beginning of the new genesis of gender, but it's only the beginning. Recognition of trans identities challenges much more than binary definitions of female gender expression. It challenges all the ways in which the gender binary defines what it means to be human. Though the new genesis of gender has just begun, feminist, feminism helps us imagine some of its consequences. We've become accustomed to the fact that gender expression may vary widely among women, and that even the most happily heteronormative women may express their gender differently at different times, wherein, say, masculine work clothes during the day and extremely feminine clothes to go out at night. In the wake of the new genesis of gender, we'll become accustomed to the idea that anyone's gender expression may vary widely and often, not only within the ranges we now think of as masculinity or femininity, but in ways that combine or confound those categories. We'll be used to the idea that what we know of individuals' gender identities and even physical sex-defining characteristics may vary as well. Just as many women who don't think of themselves as feminists, including some of my Orthodox Jewish students, now feel comfortable wearing jeans, in the wake of the new genesis of gender, even those of us who don't think of ourselves as trans will feel free to live in ways that don't fit the constraints, definitions, and assumptions of the gender binary. Maybe the new genesis of gender is really the beginning of the end of gender, the beginning of an era in which each of us will enjoy an individuality as absolute as that of the primordial pre-Eve Adam, with no gender to conform to or worry about violating, no need to sort aspects of ourselves into gendered categories, no expectations that we'll always look or act a certain way, no gender divisions of roles or power, no shared language of gender expression, and no gender identities to express. Or maybe this is the beginning of a new, more capacious, more flexible form of gender, a form of gender that doesn't define us, a form of gender that is like a language whose ever-expanding vocabulary can be endlessly, inventively recombined to express our individuality, but which, because we share it, still enables us to express and understand ourselves and our relationships with one another. Whatever we end up making of gender, and I should actually say whatever you end up making of gender, because I plan to be dead by then, but we can be sure that we'll find its transformation liberating, unsettling, exhilarating, confusing, infuriating, and despite everything, exalting. Because no matter how much discomfort it entails, the new genesis of gender will give each of us and all of us a larger and richer understanding of who we are, what we can become, and what it means to be human. Thank you. If you're like me, you now feel that you never want to hear the G word again. <laughs> Yes. Are you taking questions now? I so am. <laughs> <laughs> would you would you characterize the explosion of the gender binary and the commencement of a of an ex more expanded view of human identity as the beginning of, of the beginning of sp a spiritual expression? Or would you define that new expanded identity? in a different way? You know, I think that these categories are kind of what we make of it. And I, I feel like Genesis, in some weird way, nails that, right? God has a relationship to humanity that precedes gender, expanded or not, right? Male and female, everybody is created in the image of God. So God doesn't seem to need gender to have relationships with human beings. And as soon as human beings created gender, we started piling all sorts of things, including spiritual associations, onto it. So my guess is that 
we'll do the same thing with whatever gender is. We'll continue to, to make use of it in a lot of different kinds of ways. And those of us who are spiritual will probably use it as a way of thinking about our relationships with God. You know, the way St. John of the Cross thinks, uses gender very powerfully to think about um, a pretty intimate relationship with God, just to take one of, of many examples. So it would be surprising to me if human beings didn't do that with gender, whatever it is, not because of what gender becomes, but because human beings are always going to have that, that religious and spiritual dimension to themselves, and we're always going to use our symbolic systems to express it. Does, it. does that make sense? But I have seen, in my young life as myself, I have now seen a boatload of relations to gender. And be, because of um, the split in the, between, uh, for a lot of people, for a lot of religious people, any um, trans or queer identity is by definition secular. That's something you do when you're not religious, is you have those kinds of identities. And in the queer world, you get the others, the same assumption. Well, if you're lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans, you certainly don't want to have anything to do with religion, because those are the people who hate you. So it's oddly marginalizing to be a religious queer person. You get to be marginalized in both places. Um, I think that's an artificial division. I think that more and more, uh, there are more and more people saying, you know, regardless of what my gender identification or sexual orientation is, I am a religious person. In fact, I not only am I, do I have a relationship with God, but I feel connected to my religious community. I feel connected to a way of worshiping, to a language of practice, to rituals. And even though some, thing, some things about my community hurt me, I really don't want to give it up. I'm not sure that that's more important to me than being gay or whatever. It creates very difficult um, situations. But so ultimately, I think these sorts of things are are simultaneous dimensions of being human. I think most people, not all people, but most people have religious and spiritual dimensions to them. And as you now have heard ad nauseum, I think most people have complicated relations to gender in them, and it's it's all going on at the same time. And we've divided it up in ways that I don't think are sustainable, because I don't think they're true to what it means to be a full human being. Yes? Do you think there's a pattern in the history of saints and sages that kind of um, uh, move in that direction of uh, busting the gender binary? I, mean, I, I can think of many examples. I think that the, there is a strong pattern, saints and sages and um, wise people and healers and you know all kinds of people there's uh, and I can't remember who this anthropologist was but somebody noted a long time ago that these people tend to be different they tend to be marginal sometimes they have physical disabilities sometimes there seems to be like what we would call a queerness to them but and the anthropological explanation was that people who really fit very well into their societies do a very bad job of recognizing how those societies work when you feel alienated, when you're like the person at the party who's not partying, you see where the hookups are and where the fights are happening, where you get to watch what's happening, and you become wise. And so also, I think that it's pretty disturbing to be with somebody who's in the middle of having an intimate relationship with God. It must not have been fun to be around Jeremiah when he started telling you that you and your entire way of life was about to be destroyed. Right? Total bummer. They threw him into a pit. He was such a downer. Right? So I think that um, there's something that it requires the ability to be different, to have intense spiritual experience. And also being different, I think, fosters ways of seeing and being that are outside social norms and conventions. Yes? Uh, using the framework that you laid out, which is um, to use terminology that some of the students who take Jews, Jews, and Jewish identities are familiar with uh, the simplest, the literal, or shot reading of uh, Genesis, what then, and this is total on the spot, so you can say you need to think about it, but what do you make of uh, then after eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that one of the consequences of that, which using this framework mm -hmm. takes us down the road to reinforce binary differences and stuff, is seeing 
one another's, uh, or Adam and Eve seeing one another's nakedness. Uh, just the physical mm. ability, I guess, uh, to see what role do you think that might be? Does that make sense? Uh, yes. So I feel like the best job of this was done by John Milton in Paradise Lost. He does this really great, very detailed exploration of how Adam and Eve's consciousness is changed by eating the apple. And it's basically like a bad frat party. So they eat the apple, they have this fizzy sense of exaltation, this leads them into a sexual frenzy. Boy, were they stupid not to have eaten the apple before this. This feels so good. And then they wake up in the morning with the mother of all hangovers. And they really don't like each other very much anymore. So he does a pretty detailed and nuanced exploration of how the world looks differently before and after. Um, the Bible makes it clear that what we think of as being human is really different than what they were before that change in consciousness, but doesn't fill in the blanks very much and it associates it with shame. So the first consequence of eating the apple, the knowledge of good and evil, it seems to be to feel ashamed of yourself. And I would say shame is you, the big, um, terrible psychological consequence of the gender binary that's universal. I think the gender binary makes all of us feel ashamed at least some of the time. So when I started to transition, um, I started to have people who weren't trans come out to me as feeling ashamed of not really living up to, you know, I know how I look, but I've, I've never really felt like I was very good at being a woman. I mean, I just don't get that stuff. And, you know, I, um, I looked at women's magazines, both for tips, which actually I could never follow because I'm terrible at following directions, I mean, it just, I never really did learn much of that stuff. But um, I used them for poems also, which were weird and not informative. Um, but what was amazing to me was that these magazines assumed that every month, every woman forgot pretty much everything about female gender expression. <laughs> like, you know, probably 28th, 39th, 30th day of the month, you don't even know how to tie your shoes anymore. Until that next issue of Cosmo comes, you should not step out the door. Your hair is going to be a mess. Your you know, color choices will be awful. And God forbid you try to have a relationship, you won't know what to say. Right? So, um, so the premise in this is that being a woman is something that everybody always feels inadequate about. If not everybody, enough people to sell enormous amounts of advertising. Right? Um, and that, I think, traces to this sense of shame. And, it, you know, when I was living as a guy and hanging out with guys, there's a tremendous amount of shame among men for not being real enough, for not being tough enough, for not being this enough or that enough. And, uh, you know, what I would say is that there's always parts of us that stick out of our assigned gender roles. We always know it. And that means that we, we live within the gender binary. We get a lot of benefits from it. I, you know, I'm not in a position just to want to smash the gender binary because I have a binary gender identity. If the gender binary disappeared, I have no clue what I would be or how I would define myself. But I pay a price. And that price is shame and fear for not getting it right, for being things that disqualify me. And that was acute for me as a trans woman because there are people where no matter what I do, they wouldn't accept my gender expression as a sign of, of you know, female gender identity. Um, but it is something that so many women have expressed in so many different ways that I've come to think that it is that, you know, Adam and Eve see that they're naked and they feel like they're failures. They have failed to get dressed in the morning. They're not presenting themselves right. And I'm just going to take a wild guess that they decided they need, needed leaves of different trees. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very, you know, it's, t it's a tender moment that, uh, you know, God curses them with patriarchy, not so nice. But before sending them out, God sews clothes for them. And it's such a tender human gesture. It's part of what changes for them is that 
being human means you're not done just by being naked. Animals are. Um, Aaron has these beautiful cats. They really don't need clothes. There does seem to be a booming industry in pet Halloween costumes, which I'm <laughs> completely baffled by. But you know, you don't look at a cat and say, your cat is naked. Right? So they're just fine in themselves. And Adam and Eve, that's the way they were. They felt like they didn't think, I'm not wearing clothes. They were just fine as they were. And this change in consciousness made them say, I need something else. Not because I'm cold, but I need a layer of signification on top of me, because that's what clothing is doing for us. It's signifying who we are in ourselves and who we are in relation to one another. And without it, we feel like we're incomplete and we're ashamed. And you know, when you, or we were talking about Orange is the New Black, you go into prison, they strip you down, they hose you down, they let you know that you are, you no longer have any control over your clothing choices, you're not gonna wear anything that expresses any aspect of who you are, and that it doesn't relate you to anybody except in defining you as a prisoner, not something that most people want to be. So this is, you know, that was the extra layer of humanness. We can't be human unless we're covered in some way with symbols that define us. And in cultures where there's a lot of nudity, you still have a lot of symbols. You have ways of doing hair, you have tattooing, um, you have body gestures and facial expressions. So um, human beings are not naturally naked after infancy. It wasn't a pushback, but you also talked about um, that in the trans community as well as like the religious community, both sides sort of disassociate with one another that you can be both at the same time. Could you try to describe sort of that conflict a little bit more? Or if you feel like mm -hmm. maybe the God that you speak to might be different from what someone else might hear? Mm. So one is a question about human the way human society groups organize themselves. And another is a question about individual religious experience. So I just want to separate those. Um, most traditional religious communities have, there are actually quite different definitions of gender and male-female relationships in different traditional religious communities. When I say traditional religious communities, it's as though they're all the same, they're all different. Um, but they all tend to have pretty fixed and pretty binary. Occasionally there's a third gender, but almost everybody's binary within that culture anyway, um, relations to gender. And for many people, the news of other ways of being is like it's part of feminism. It's, it's part of this sort of Western enlightenment thinking that says, we can think outside of the box of religious categories. And we can think outside of the box of religious categories quickly degenerated into, in order to think more broadly, we have to stop being religious. So if you look at the early enlightenment figures, most of them are pretty religious. You know, Newton is believing that God is the one who sets everything in motion, for example. Um, and the split doesn't happen until later as scientific discourse gains cultural authority, religious discourse starts to lose cultural authority and they start creating their own little binary tug of war over who gets what. They start to seem mutually exclusive. But for Orthodox Jews, like there are ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities where rabbis have forbidden use of the internet, which apparently is a very hard prohibition to enforce. Um, Ultra-Orthodox Jews like surfing the web as, as much as anybody else does. But the reason is that they believe there's no homosexuality in an Orthodox community unless it comes from the secular culture, from the outside. And in one way, this is true. If you grow up inside that culture, it won't give you a word even for homosexuality. It doesn't offer that way of thinking. It says, you know, there are these disgusting behaviors that men may do with men, women may do with women. There's no idea if this is an identity or, I mean, it's like, it, do, it doesn't exist, it only comes from the outside, and it doesn't come from other Jewish communities. You don't go to the Reform Jewish website and learn about gay identity. You go to secular websites, and that's where it is. And so 
for a lot of people in various traditional communities, that stuff is all stuff that comes from the outside, from a world, literally, that's different. So if, you, you know, my students who are Orthodox, who have grown up Orthodox, they live in a God-centered universe. They live in a universe where what they do has meaning because it matters to God. Did you light Shabbat candles on time? Does that seem neurotic? Absolutely, it's totally obsessive compulsive. But on the other hand, these are women in a misogynist culture who know that their lives have meaning because it's their job to light those candles on time. And that matters to God and it matters to everybody around them. They're part of the function of the universe. They also watch television in a secular universe where there is no God and there's no guaranteed meaning. There's just whatever people make up. And that part where there is no God that's guaranteeing meaning is where most people are getting these ideas of non-binary identities. But that, I think, is to some extent an accident of culture. I mean, you don't think it's necessary because I know ultra-Orthodox people, not just, I'm weird, right? So there, I'm not, I don't fit any Jewish category, so I'm a bad example. But I know ultra-Orthodox trans Jews who are really trans and they're really ultra-Orthodox. They really live in that God-centered universe and they're trans. So clearly these things are not incompatible. It's just that historically that's the way that they've grown up. By the same token, people who are queer, who are not religious, often see those as mutually exclusive because their experience of religion is the thing that makes you ashamed of who you are, the thing that encourages other people to take your rights away, to hound you, to harass you. They have positive associations with religion, maybe because they were kicked out of religious homes that weren't where there was intolerance, or because a lot of the cartoons, the representations of religious people in religious communities in our secular media actually are pretty horrible cartoons. The media loves horrible religious communities. You know, you don't see a lot of depictions of, you know, breaking news, a progressive, moderate Christian community, right? No, you're much more likely to hear about, you know, a tiny group that is, you know, saying soldiers die because homosexuality is a sin against God, right? Those people get a lot of press coverage, but it doesn't represent the range of, of what, you know, religious communities are. But for people who are on the outside of that, that tends to be what they see. So again, I feel like it's a historical accident. And, you know, but if I'm in a, a queer setting and I talk about believing in God, I know that other people are going to see me as an idiot. I know that there are trans people who will never read my memoir. Not that every trans person should read every trans memoir. Who has time? But, um, but they won't read it because it says a Jewish journey. And they're like, OK. It's about Jewishness or it's about religion. It's clearly not something I'm interested in at all. So that, um, that's sad. It's not necessary. Um, and I think it's going to be temporary. Yes. I mean, you kind of, with that last thing, you kind of answer my question a little bit. Because I know nothing about being Jewish or an Orthodox Jew. But I feel like if you, because you said that, um, there isn't a word for it kind of in that community. So, like, and like that the rabbis don't use the internet because without that secular thing, then it doesn't exist, kind of. Um, but if it is, like, I, I don't feel like it's a choice. So, if it is not a choice, then wouldn't eventually there have to be, it, wouldn't it have to be incorporated in some way? Because if there are these people feeling that way, eventually. Yes. So the rabbis are in denial. And traditional communities are in denial, but not just traditional communities, you know. We don't have drug abuse in our community. Right. You know, there are all these small white towns where everybody's addicted to painkillers, but we don't have drug abuse in our community, right? Because we're not going to acknowledge that we have drug abuse in our community. And until we do, we don't have a problem. So this is a version of that. You know, there are people who are gay. There are people who are, are by, they're, they don't even know what they are. Human desire is human desire, it's gonna manifest. But the cult, so if you're a an or, young ultra-Orthodox kid and you fall in love with your male study partner, um, you have a very bad range of choices for what your culture, how your culture tells you to understand those feelings. 
you can understand them. You can't understand them as an identity, a way to connect with other people, part of that. You would pretty much identify them as sinful impulses that need to be controlled. Yetzer hara, the, the evil impulse. And when you suffer, because you know it sucks to have sexual impulses that you feel are inherently evil and that you need to repress, then you need to understand that not as, wow, I really need to get laid, but you know, God has sent me this suffering. And if I love God, I need to embrace this suffering. And if you go to a rabbi, there are many very psychologically astute and empathetic rabbis, they'll say, yes, this is terrible suffering. I have no idea why God gave you this suffering. Human beings suffer in all different ways, and I have no idea why. But that's part of being human, and every human being needs to bear their suffering in a way that is consistent with a good relationship to God. Those are your choices. That's what your culture tells you is going on. That's like the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is they get rid of you um, in one way or the other. They sanction abuse of you. They tell people to beat you up because surely if you're beaten up enough, you'll give up these sinful impulses, right? Aversion therapy, reparative therapy. Um, so yeah, it's there, but it's not understood as being, you know, just a different way of being human. Yes? I really enjoyed your paper, gender, uh, uh, Genesis of Gender, and I was just wondering if in your transition or in, um, frankly, anyone's transition, do you think that sometimes there's too much of an emphasis on the actual gender binary that you're switching from one category to another rather than just, well, actually, it doesn't, maybe it's not so much about being um, male or female and wanting that desire, but maybe it's just the desire of wanting to express yourself how you find fulfillment. So do you ever feel like there's too much emphasis on um, the category of womanhood rather than just expressing yourself as, as you find fulfillment and as you would like to go through your mm. days? And I know that it, it does have to do with the core of gender expression, mm. but um, I don't know. This is the first experience I have with really learning about transsexuality and unfortunately it's a personal experience I wish I was made more aware of this earlier in my life but I just wonder like is there a fine line between too much emphasis on trans or on um, changing genders rather than just expressing your humanness mm. in whatever form you may want I think that human growth and this is transition is really a human growth process usually doesn't have much to do with proportionality. So I'm going to give a better answer than that. But one thing you'll notice about little kids is they like to spin around. And it's like, what is it with three-year-olds and spinning around? Well, what it turns out it is, is that in order for their brains to develop in certain kinds of ways, they need to spin around. Mm -hmm. And they have a capacity that most adults lose to not get nauseous because they need to do this spinning around, and if it felt bad to them, they wouldn't do it. So instead, it feels great to them. And they do it way too much. And then they grow up and, thank God, move on to the next stage, because otherwise, you would all be in spinning chairs, and throughout this whole talk, we'd all be just spinning around. That would be irritating. So, um, so gender transition is a process of going, you know, it's going through a developmental process that most people go through at much earlier ages. So almost everybody does go through this at the end of childhood and the beginning of adolescence. So if you want to see excess in gender roles, go to a junior high school, dance, right? Nobody is getting gender, you know, nobody is, has a nice subtle gender expression that doesn't interfere, right? It's, everybody is doing too much or too little and it's exact, it's all that they're self-conscious the spotlight's on them every moment. It's way too much. Because not that long ago, they were children where gender didn't have any sexual implications. And now suddenly it does, and they are freaked out. They have no idea what to do with it. They have to do it way too much 
before they can start to grow into it in more refined ways, and they need to experiment, right? I mean, how many people here are, have this exact same personal style that they did when they were sophomores in high school? I'm not seeing any hands. <laughs> yeah, so that's what happens. So even after junior high school, people do a lot of experimenting and trying out different ways of being this new thing that they're supposed to be, men and women. And the more you do it, the better a sense, the better sense you have of the ways you can do it, of the choices that you can make, of the consequences. Of, wow, wearing that to a job interview was a really bad decision. I, I get that now. Bikinis and secretarial jobs, no. Um, you know, when I came back to work at Yeshiva, they bizarrely told me, of course, I had to wear appropriate attire. And I would love to know what they were afraid I was going to come to work in. Cocktail dresses, cheerleader uniforms. I mean, you just can, what does the Orthodox Jewish imagination imagine when it thinks about someone like me coming back to teach? I don't know. But, um, but I know that I had no idea when I started to transition what those choices were. I didn't even know what my clothing size was. I didn't know how women's clothing was sized. Have you ever tried shopping without knowing anything about your size or about the types of garments or about colors or styles or anything? I would just go into Salvation Army and I'd be like, this might fit. If it fits, that's good, right? No. <laughs> um, so, you know, it took a lot of trial and error to have a gender expression that was really expressing anything of me. But in a, in a deeper sense, because you're asking also a deeper question, it matters a lot because for trans people, identity grows from the outside in because of this weird arrested development. You develop a sense of yourself that you never get to live, and then when you get to start living it, the rest of you grows from this outward expression inward. So the first thing I needed was to see myself in the mirror. And I remember the first time that happened. And it was so stupidly artificial. You know, I was living as a guy, I had not started hormone treatment. I had a friend who was quite a successful actress. And um, I was spending the night at her house. And she said, you know, I asked her, would you be willing to make me up? I was terrified of trying to do makeup. What if I got it wrong? What if it turned out like, that I am untransitionable. Yeah, well, I, so I didn't want to do it because I knew I was going to screw it up. And she said, sure, I'll, sure, I'll do that. And, and she, she did. And I looked in the mirror and I was like, I saw somebody I'd never seen before, but it was the first time I saw somebody who looked at all like me. Didn't look at all the way I look now. But it was the first time that my female gender identity had any outward correlative to it. I looked in the mirror and I saw somebody who wasn't me. Well, once you start seeing somebody who's like you, that creates possibilities of getting to know yourself that don't exist until you do that. But you, you can't, I think, pick and choose wisely among those possibilities until you've gone around the block quite a few times, in, in my case. Actually, I got lucky. You know, People realized my incapacity in certain areas and just started giving me clothes. So. Um, so there were people with taste who, who did interventions, <laughs> stopped some really bad things from happening. But I still have some things from the bad old days. <laughs> yeah? Um, I just wanted to say, like, I think you look so amazing, radiant, and alive. Like, I cannot imagine you any other way. And in fact, when I saw the book, before I actually, like, read the title and started reading it, like, I had it just looked like you. Like I had no idea that you know um, about like biologically or whatever. It's, it's amazing, and I want to thank you so much for um, sharing your story. Like all those raw feelings, like you never know who it can touch. It totally touched me. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. My um, my publisher ordered me to have my picture on the cover of the book. And if you're an academic, like I'm just guessing your books don't have your smiling face on the cover, <laughs> right? If you're Deepak Chopra, your smiling face is on the cover of your books. If you're Oprah, your face is probably on every page. I've never read a book by Oprah, but you know, I'm just guessing. 
but if you're an academic, you have some you know, really boring image and a really boring title, and that's how you know you're an academic, right? So, so and this is a university press, so I'm, I'm like, I'm figuring to get the, you know, the respectable treatment. They're like, no, you have to have your picture on the cover. And I said, you know, this is not transsexuality as a way to extend your life. You know, this is not, I can't do this. And, well, marketing insists. Why? What does marketing think is going on? Finally, they were blunt. They said, look, your book has so much pain and despair in it, no one will make it through to the end unless they see you looking happy on the cover. And so I, so I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, that makes sense to me. And um, they, I got this, paid this photographer, I had to pay, it's a university press. And we went up to the roof of my um, girlfriend's apartment in New York. And she took like hundreds of pictures and the wind was blowing and the sun was in my eyes. There was something about her. She's not even that friendly a person. I don't know what it is, but whenever I looked at her, I just kind of felt happy and I would start smiling. <laughs> and so I am having this great time. And, and that picture does, I think, capture something about who I am, but also why I just, I needed to be this. And when my, as I said in the book, when my older daughter first saw pictures of me as myself, she said, Daddy, why don't you ever have that light in your face when you look at us? Because that light can only be in our faces when we are ourselves. And I have no idea why that would involve makeup and clothing choices. And that's one of the mysteries of being human. Maybe it's one of the consequences of eating the apple. Style, fashion, gender, these things. But, but it just is absolutely true for me. Yes, Rena. So there are some cultures, yes, that see um, transsexuality as holy. And they have like holy and shamanic roles in the culture. And for me, they are way ahead of where we are. That they, that there is a sense of connection to God that goes beyond this sort of, I, I don't know if binary is the right word, but we also put God in these insanely contained boxes and concepts and notions that go beyond a sense of oneness. And um, for me, spiritually, the, um, what you're talking about is holding up an idea about holiness and spirituality that is where we need to go as a world rather than kind of move back from. You know, I, for me, there is, it gets back to that image of God thing. I don't know. I, is it, is it weird to like Genesis this much? I guess it really is. It's <laughs> definitely old fashioned. But to me there's, even though the male and female, God created the male and female, really problematic. To me there's nothing more profound than the statement that God created human beings in God's image. Every single exactly. one. There was this beautiful rabbinical comment. A rabbi during the Roman Empire was asked, what the heck does that mean? Because in Judaism, that's a bizarre thing to say because you're told that God has no image. And if you make an image for God, you've totally screwed up. So what does it mean to make people in God's image when God doesn't have an image? So the rabbi said, look, look at the coins, the Roman coins. They're all stamped with the emperor's face. They're all identical. Well, God stamps each human being in God's image, and they all look different. That's the difference between God's image and a human image. You know, to be made in God's image is to really, really be yourself. And so I have a profound belief that the more true we are to ourselves and the more embracing we are of the, of the richness and the differences that make up humanity, which I find very challenging. I, mean, I can talk a good game, but I'm as, you know, messed up and blinkered as anybody else is. But I believe that the closer we come to that, I do believe that the closer we come to making visible the image of God, that light inside everyone, and, and recognizing like maybe humanity is a mosaic. And when we see every person actually completely be themselves, maybe we'll realize that, that mosaic all taken together, we're looking at God.
Nobody wants to use the G word again? Come on, there's still time. <laughs> Were you going to say something? Well, why don't we call the program here and maybe we can stay sure. after for a few minutes? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you.